you're listening to Hold On a Minute, a podcast by UNFPA Asia and the Pacific. This podcast series presents inspiring and powerful stories on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women across the Asia Pacific region. I'm Pupei Chao Dat Yong Jiren, on your host. On this episode of Hold On a Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, we look at what the International Conference on Population and Development, or ICPD, is and why it matters by reflecting on the career of former regional director for UNFPA Asia and the Pacific, Bjorn Andersen. ICPD was the result of a 1994 meeting in Cairo, where 179 governments adopted a revolutionary program of action and called for women's reproductive health and rights to be on the center stage of national and global development efforts. Over the decades, this mandate has helped countries shape their policies to be more focused on women's rights. Yet, globally and specifically in the Asia-Pacific region, megatrends such as migration, urbanization, aging, climate change, and digitalization are changing the way governments are accelerating the ICPD program of action. Today, we are very honored to be able to gain insights from former regional director for UNFPA Asia and the Pacific, Bjorn Anderson, on the ICPD. Bjorn ended his assignment in August 2023 after serving the position for over six years. Prior to his time as regional director, he served as chief of staff to two executive directors of UNFPA from 2013 to 2017. During his three decades of extensive experience in international development cooperation, Bjorn has held key positions in program management, policy development, and strategic organizational management in the UN system and government agencies. Bjorn shares his insights on the evolution of the ICPD over the last three decades as someone who has been there from the start and helped support the preparations for the revolutionary conference held in Cairo in 1994. Jorn, you have just completed six years of serving as regional director for UNFPA Asia and the Pacific Regional Office, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to speak with you on this special episode of our podcast series, where we would like to really hear your reflections on the population dynamics in Asia and the Pacific. So let's start with some general reflections from you. Looking back, can you tell us how it has been for you to serve in this role? Personally, it has been the most uh, uh, job satisfaction I've had in my whole career. Um, I started with UNFPA in 1993 and have worked uh, on and off uh, uh, in, in the organization and with the Swedish government. It has been really a eye-opener in many ways. I think uh, Asia and the Pacific is, if not the most, uh, uh, certainly among the most uh, uh, dynamic regions in the world. If you look at it, uh, a great diversity between countries. And that, of course, has challenged us in implementing or moving towards the ICPD program of action, the International Conference on Population and Development, which was held in 1994. And I think we, we if, if I briefly can go back to that time, it was very different. We were just getting out of many years of talking about population targets, uh, talking about uh, population growth. So, of course, that was on the mind among participants at the time. But the conference was really changed the concept, changed how we were working and approaching population and development issues to place human rights in the forefront together with gender equality. And I think that has then over the years um, ref reflected well into the work of UNFPA in Asia and, and the Pacific. And we have been able, or what I've seen also during the past few years, been able to make great progress in all different parts of the population and development agenda. I'm thinking about maternal health, and family planning. But at the same time, there are gaps. There are many, many challenges remaining 
to reach the zero preventable maternal deaths and to reach zero uh, unmet need for family planning services. Where we still have a huge challenge is on gender-based violence. Uh, we have made great progress in, in better data, in better evidence, which helps us to have a more effective and impactful communication with the government representatives and, and other partners. And that is a great progress in itself. And then, of course, all of this data needs to be translated into programming in communities and in countries. I also think that uh, UNFPA in Asia and the Pacific region over the past six years have highlighted uh, clearly issues around population aging and low fertility. And low fertility is something which is very new to many countries, especially in this region, compared to when we had ICPD um, in 1994. Well, you know, what's interesting is is the points that you mentioned in terms of um, how there has been progress, but at the same time, there's still a lot of challenges. And you mentioned the um, ICPD, the International Conference on Population Development uh, Program of Action. Can you tell us a little bit more for the, for the listeners, what exactly that is and, and why does it matter for all nations and individuals? So uh, ICPD stands for the International Conference on Population and Development. Or we also often say the Cairo Conference, because it was held in, in Cairo in Egypt in 1994. If you look at what happened in the 90s, there were many global conferences. You had the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development. You have the Beijing Conference on, on Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality. You had the Copenhagen Conference on Social Development. And you had the Cairo Conference. So in the 1990s, we had um, an environment globally where you had government officials coming together with civil society organizations, with activists, especially women's organizations, uh, together with academia, young people. And that movement that I saw when I participated in the Cairo conference myself was quite unique. And that was a unique moment in in the sense that we here managed to, or the global community managed to have a conference as a basis, as one basis for the sustainable development goals, which were then developed uh, much later. Um, so it, it really meant a, a shift in the thinking uh, around, yes, population development, but perhaps more importantly around sexual and reproductive health and rights, including maternal health, family planning, comprehensive sexuality education, the need for young people to have accurate information about sexuality and relationships and all of that. Um, so it was groundbreaking, I would say. And, and of course, at that time when I participated, you know, you didn't realize that it, you know, that it would become so groundbreaking as it has. And the fact that we are still referring to the ICPD program of action now almost 30 years after its endorsement just speaks for itself, right? That, how important it is. But you know, at the same time, we also have to be very clear how we are communicating about the substantive part of the ICPD program of action. Because if you talk to a young person today, who might have been born after the Cairo conference, the ICPD doesn't really mean anything. So it's important to flag for especially um, young people, youth, that it, it's about their bodies, about their bodily autonomy, about their rights to sexual and reproductive health, about their rights not to be um, married uh, before uh, the age of 18. It's about them growing up to become uh, members of communities and and uh, be an, you know active drive the development in their respective countries and all of that is grounded in the comprehensive or holistic approach to sexual and reproductive health and rights that you can't just single out one part of it and think that that is the solution now issues around SRHR and population and development 
are very personal, but they are, they are at the same time very political in many ways. And I think that political aspects of population and development on, on reproductive health, we are still seeing that today in different shapes and forms in Asia and the Pacific. So while the ICPD has put on the map human rights, women's rights, women's empowerment and gender equality, there are also resistance in many countries uh, around, the, around the world uh, to, to make sure that we can fulfill what governments agreed to achieve in the ICPD program of action. From listening to you, Bjorn, I feel that it's so fascinating that you've been there since the beginning. And, you know, even though time flies, you know, that period of 30 years, uh, you know, it throughout the various challenges that has been uh, seen and, and also in terms of um, the, the different aspects that have evolved along the way, how culture, society has changed and, and also the dealings with different stakeholders, it's a quite a big an achievement. Uh, you know, and and since the ICPD program of action has been adopted in 1994, this means that you know, as you mentioned, it's it's going to reach the 30-year milestone soon since its adoption. Um, let us pause then and think about what has been done. You you tease a little bit about you know the work that has been done, um, but in terms of what I just mentioned, you know, the the various big stakeholders involved in the situation, how are UNFPA and indeed indeed the governments? taking stock and, and marking this important occasion? So, so the way that we are working as, as a UN agency to, to you know, promote and, and to advance the ICPD program of action, I, I, I just want to say first that having seen this development, having been part of this process for so many years, I am actually relieved in a way that ICPD also had a, was one input into the Sustainable Development Goals which uh, the world community adopted back in uh, um, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Um, because, you know, if you look at the sustainable development goals, you, you have access to reproductive health clearly in it. You have health issues, gender equality, human rights, um, good governance, and all these aspects which are so important for uh, achieving um, sexual and reproductive health and rights, universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, and also to address population and development and the mega trends we can see in societies today or in at the regional level. And um, that is, you know, I think that is a notion that has sort of grown over the years since Cairo, that people's health, people's well-being is so important to achieve sustainable development goals. It, you know, you, you have to see the environment, economic growth, and, and social development hand in hand. They, they, are in, they are linked very clearly. And I think this is something that has come out more clearly over the past few years, the importance also to make sure that women can deliver safely, that, that women, men, and young people have access to uh, family planning services or contraceptives. And I think that, that, that's where you find the, the uh, very, very good progress. But like I said before, there are countries, there are pockets in countries, especially among ethnic minorities or, or persons with disabilities, L the LGBTQI plus uh, uh, community, that, that needs to continue to, we need to continue to focus. We need to make sure that we are not leaving anyone behind, which is also the uh, sentiment of, of the sustainable development goals. Now, what we are facing, if you're looking ahead and, and you know, taking stock of where we are, yes, as, an, as a UN organization, we are working with governments across Asia and the Pacific region to have uh, events at the national level to uh, commemorate ICPD and to keep it alive. And like I said before, to keep it alive for young people. So I've seen many, many interesting activities across the region. And all of this will culminate, come together in here in Bangkok at the UN uh, in mid-November at the uh, Asia-Pacific Population Conference. That is an opportunity where we also can, you know, 
continue and maybe kickstart a conversation about future challenges re related to population and development and SRHR. And I'm thinking of the climate crisis, for example. How will that impact the discussions around population and development? Population aging and low fertility is a fairly new phenomenon in many countries. And um, while they are related, they are two separate aspects. Population aging is really to see how can we support uh, elderly in so that they can continue having an active and healthy life. And, and our approach to that is very much to, to stress the importance to invest in sexual and reproductive health, in comprehensive sexuality education, in women's empowerment, gender equality throughout the life cycle. Also, so that you build up that resilience, that skill uh, in, in people so that they can use it also when they, when they grow older. Low fertility is an area where, where I can see a lot of political challenges, if you like. Um, many governments, uh, and, and it's, they, and it's going very fast in Asia and the Pacific. If you compare to Europe and, and other parts of the world, it has the, the low fertility, the transition has taken much longer. But here it's going very, very fast in this region. And governments are desperate to find a solution to that. What is clear is that we cannot, we cannot come back to a situation where we're talking about targets, where we're talking about, um, you know, more or less forcing women uh, to have more children. No, but what what the evidence shows us is that access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, human rights and women's rights in particular, is the solution. Then governments can stimulate, um, stimulate and facilitate for women to combine their family life with their career. Governments can look into, I mean, it's expensive to put a child into education these days if you want a good, good school. So many... Many uh, um, women who have an academic background, they might say, like, no, I, I can't afford that. Or, and women, you know, who have also now, and that's a very positive sign. More women are, are completing their, uh, you know, university education. And, and, you know, of course, you want to have a career and you want to combine that with, with, um, with a family. So there are ways that governments can... Um, stimulate it and make facilitate it but that's one thing and it's very different from going into targets and directives right on 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 uh, on, uh, on child i think on, it's, on it's so yeah so it's so important beyond that you said that if we really have to think about it's about the people it's about people's lives and um it's kind of saddening that we still do have that kind of pressure me as a woman, you know, living in this region, um, I can understand how how you know the political side of the situation or, or the concern of the you know the whole country nationwide, whether it's in Southeast Asia or in other countries nearby in Asia, it's always been about how do we um, power the next generation, how do we you know develop as a country with an aging society, um, but taking all of these changes. That has taken place. Um, it would be really nice to actually interesting to to get your perspective, your sense of how the changes have been brought about in in the region, and uh, how women's and girls' rights and you know our lives have improved uh, with the the programs that you have been involved in. Let, let me just start that that during over the past six years, as I've been a, a regional director, and and I'm now moving on to a new function new role within the organization, I have convinced myself, if you like, <laughs> that understanding the bigger pictures in societies about urbanization, migration, the climate crisis, uh, the economic development, humanitarian situations, that is something that is the overall arcing framework in which parliamentarians and policymakers are making decisions, they're making budget allocations for social services or so for whether it's uh, the agriculture sector or infrastructure. We have to understand that much better, but it's not enough. You have to then go to the communities, to individuals in rural areas, in urban areas, to understand how people are thinking, 
How are women thinking? How are young people thinking about their families, about their careers? And what are their what are the factors that they consider in making their choices in life? But we need, and this is a, for me a very strategic challenge, we need to understand both sides as working in this area. We need to understand how these bigger pictures of climate crisis, of, of economic development, migration patterns, views in society, how that is impacting on individual behavior. Uh, and, and the norms and values which often communities are carrying on, and we need to understand how can we address those norms and values which are harmful to women, and which is, makes it more difficult for for women to to um, access university access sexual and reproductive health and services. And I'm saying this because it's important for parliamentarians and policymakers to understand what is going on in communities, what's going on in societies, and the minds of their voters. And vice versa, it's so important for individual men and women to internalize what does it mean, gender equality in my context? What does human rights and reproductive rights, what does it mean to me? And they need, in, in many countries, you have very, very good laws around uh, 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 female genital mutilation, gender bias, sex selections, laws promoting gender equality, and communities need to internalize these laws so that they understand this is my right. And it is not my, it is not okay to be beaten by my husband. Right? Gender-based violence, we see that it's a prevalence across the region. But what the progress is, what I can see, we have a progress in the thinking on how to prevent gender-based violence, how to provide services and support to survivors of gender-based violence. And I can see that conversation being something which is really, it's a positive development, but it's still far from being implemented at the community level. Again, I, what I see also in this region, with the rapid development of technologies, you have uh, digitalization in, 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 in countries. That opens up um, many, many opportunities and more access to information around SRHR, access around, uh, uh, you know, various opportunities for women in particular to, to you know, make, have a career and, and, and education. But at the same time, there are also challenges with technologies, with the digitalization. If the social norms in societies are not changing in such a way that it actually prevents for example, cyberbullying. So we need to be very clear what is happening in societies and at the same time, what is the thinking in urban areas or rural areas. And this region has a challenge here, given its geography, many small islands, more small isolated islands or valleys up in, in landlocked countries where you need to be able to, to, to reach, you know, about with information and services. Um, I have no doubt that this region will address that because, you know, the capacity in Asia and the Pacific across in, in most countries is very high. And the willingness like you are talking about among women in particular and men is to improve their lives. So I think the force to make sure that ICPD and other agreements made by the United Nations, it actually rests with individual men and women. And we just need to be supporting them and their communities and their groups and civil society organizations to be this torchbearer of, of making things better for themselves, to understand what human rights means for them, what, what gender equality means for a community or for, for me as a man or a woman. And the investment in that, I, I think, is the, the absolute way forward because the power is coming from individual men and women and young people. It has always been the case. And if we are not going to have a backlash on ICPD, and, and my message has always been to, to whether it's inter internally within UNFPA or externally, is that gender equality, women's rights, and human rights in the broader sense are absolutely essential for achieving the, uh, the goals in the ICPD program of action. 
And without a vibrant civil society, without understanding on what has been achieved so far, if that is not strong in societies, and we have seen this in countries across the, across the world, that laws can change quickly, which makes it much more difficult for people to have access to universal, to, uh, to have universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And that's something, you know, we, we all have to be very mindful about as we are moving forward now in the next steps of the ICPD program of action. And when we are using it to provide that safety and security to individuals and to, to make sure that it continues to be a very um, important document for the next generations. Mm, well said, Bjorn. Um, and Bjorn, it cannot be denied that you have had such an expansive uh, career. And, uh, you know, when we take a look at your tenure with UNFPA Asia Pacific, um, I'm sure there's a lot of the moments that, you know, that during your time that have touched you. But if you could just give us a significant, memorable moment that has deeply touched you to share with us, with our listeners, can you, can you tell us a little bit about maybe a, an incident? You know, I'm continuing within UNFPA to work in the area of humanitarian work. Um, and I think the strongest moment, or the, 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 which has also been very emotional for me, is in humanitarian settings when I meet men and women who who are who had to fled, had to flee, or or um, whether it was a natural disaster, flooding, you know, earthquake, or because of of armed conflict or conflicts in society. And I had a very strong moment six years ago when I came to visit Cox's Bazar in, in Bangladesh, and I met women who had um, fled from their home country, and uh, they had been, um, uh, they were survivors of gender-based violence. They had been uh, raped, they had been sexual assault, and I was invited to meet with them, which was, at the time, you know, which was unusual because I, as a man they wanted to protect the space for all these women which i fully understand but they they wanted to see me and they were open to that and i asked them questions so so how can i as a or how can our our organization how can we support you in any way and and you know realizing the the enormous amount of um, challenges and suffering and what they had survived it's quite daunting but it was very, they gave me a very clear message. We want justice. We want justice. And it was really like a, a words that came out and then that triggered a lot of emotional feelings among this group of, of women of different ages. That made such an impression on me. And it has been with me here all the time when I've been here in Asia and the Pacific. And it also gave me, you know, a kind of a, Reflecting on that incident or that what I experienced, which was, of course, very emotional and difficult at the time, but it has also strengthened me in my own thinking around how important the ICPD program of action actually was 30 years ago. And I was very fortunate and privileged to attend it. And with my different roles in UNFPA and in my home country, I now when I'm finishing my tenure here in, in, in Bangkok as the regional director, it, it, is, um, it gives me closure, if you like, uh, to be able to see how the, um, you know, the, the, how the world community can come together to craft such a strong document. And then it gives us working in this area, it gives government, it gives civil society organizations the mandate also in humanitarian situations to really address very personal issues uh, uh, that we are all facing as individuals around sexuality and, and reproduction. So I'm very thankful for having now finished my six years as, as a regional director in Asia Pacific. Well, Bjorn, thank you so much for sharing your your 
your your perspective of 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 your tenure and also the work that has been done uh, with your time here at uh, UNFPA Asia Pacific and also uh, what has been progressing so far. But looking ahead, yeah, you know, you will be you are in a new position as the senior advisor of resource mobilization and advocacy for humanitarian initiatives for UNFPA based in Geneva. Um, there's still a lot more to be done. And, and after talking to you, I hear that, you know, it's very much, uh, you know, a passion of yours to, to work in humanitarian initiatives. Can you tell us, uh, to wrap things up, you know, what are your hopes for the future in, in your work? We need to make sure that everyone, and I'm very, I mean everyone, understands that when there, whenever there is a humanitarian situation, women will continue to to be pregnant and to give birth women and men young people they will continue to uh, request or want to have access to family planning services or contraceptives and we also know that in humanitarian situations the prevalence of gender based violence is is going up these are areas that perhaps many Many colleagues working in the humanitarian area, they, they are focused on very quick life savings interventions, which is absolutely necessary. But that needs to be combined with also life savings activities around sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender based violence. And if we can achieve that understanding, and I see and I've seen it in Asia and the Pacific, how that is now more and more becoming a natural part of addressing humanitarian situations. I think that is something which is so important to continue working and, and placing on, on the map for donors and governments in general. Bjorn, thank you so much again. We are touched by what you've spoken about and we are you know, aware of the challenges that are, we still face ahead, but at the same time, we have hope from your words as to the progress that can be made. Thank you so much for being with us here on our podcast. This has been the latest episode of Hold On A Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific. It is clear that the ICPD has played a crucial role in uplifting women's reproductive health and rights around the world. We thank Bjorn once again for reflecting on his career in this region and for sharing his insights on how things have and are still progressing. For more insightful episodes of Hold On A Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, follow our podcast pages on Spotify, Facebook, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Just search for UNFPA Hold On A Minute. See you in our next episode.